Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Nicole. I'm the safety manager of the Zephyr project. And before I start, I'd like to say a big thanks to Simon um, and to Kate uh, to do the review and to contribute to the slide deck. And a big question to everyone. So this slide deck is intended to be used also to onboard people. So really, if you have questions, if you um, think I, we need to adapt things, if you think there's stuff missing, please, even if not in this round, let uh, me know or let Simon know what you think is missing on information on this one. So, yeah. So yeah, I'm Nicole. Um, I've been a C developer back, back, back in time before there was even Git. So yeah, I'm old. I started to work with functional safety then, um, been with TUV suit for quite some time. And um, in 2022, we started our own little consulting company called Electometis. I'm besides doing safety consulting, I'm involved in some of the open source projects uh, related to functional safety. I'm in Elisa, yeah, in Zephyr, I'm the safety manager. Um, and I'm in and out of uh, open chain. And yeah, I'm working on the safety profile for SPDX2. So yeah, if you want to find me on social media platforms or anything, I consistently use the handle Nick Pupler. So you should find me on Discord, on GitHub, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, always with this handle. So yeah, if you want to get in contact, just whatever platform you choose, it's always me. So today, as kind of information and hopefully onboarding uh, information, I'd like to talk about what's actually the approach that we take in Cephal for functional safety. So how and why are we doing this? What's the really work in progress? So you might have realized we talk a lot about safety, but we have uh, not produced a safety certificate yet, but there's a lot of work that's going on for that. And our call to participation. So if you want to participate, this is where you get the information how to get started. So yeah, just most of you know Zephyr, or more or less all. Uh, the takeaway point more or less is, yeah, we're heading or focusing on safety uh, besides the normal work for quite a long time. And this is what's currently going on. So yeah, we're going for functional safety as a safety element out of context. This is a standard procedure in the safety world. Um, for, uh, you can think of this like, you know, you have a big f a train or a big locomotive and yeah, this is a system that needs to be safe in itself. So safety can only be on the system level. So the train needs to be able to stop in time. The train must not go with uh, overspeed. So these are the safety uh, things that you need to consider, but you can only reach these safety uh, functions when each and every component within your train is suitable to do this. So every bolt, every screw, um, every engine, and also, also each piece of software that's in it contributes to this overall safety. So this is where we're heading to with Zephyr, to be one of these little components in a complete system the system functionality can rely on. So for those who don't know about functional safety, so that's not about electrical safety or environmental safety or mechanical safety, and also not about cybersecurity. We're talking about that part of the safety where you really rely on a specified function, that it works as intended, that in case of a malfunction, you either are able to prevent this malfunction or to catch it before something bad really happens. So you need to diagnose it and you need to have um, measures to mitigate the effects of this. So this is all about, yeah, as I said, it's the safety of the function. Um, as I already said, safety is a system property, so we can, will never be able to say use Cephal or whatever other certified OS and you will have a safe system. So it will always be one little building block in a safe system that contributes to the safety and where you need to know what to do when integrating this. And uh, yeah, really to, uh, to have something like finally this uh, certified uh, Cephal Artos, 
that you have something that you can rely on that it performs as intended, that it performs as specified. Um, standard way of doing uh, safety is always following this V model in, say, it's, yeah, it comes from system engineering. Uh, from a software perspective, especially from a current software perspective, it's nothing that you look into like a sequence model, like you did back then in systems engineering. It's a knowledge model. So you have the code, you can have the code first of all, I don't care from, from uh, my perspective, but you need to have all the other information related to it. You need to know where in the overall architecture is this code. What's the intent of this code? Why is this code here? What's the specification? What's the overall requirement? Why I have this code in the end? And then also, is this code tested? Is this really doing what I have intended? So a thing that I come across quite a lot is this, oh, the code is the truth. Everything, the code is the truth. We don't need specification. We don't need documentation. And actually, when we look into our real life, and when, if, if we open the news, we have these Waymo issues. We have planes falling from the sky. We had, I don't know, 20 years ago, cars that suddenly did ac accelerate instead of stop. And that was all in the code. And code always performs as it's been implemented. And nobody can tell me that it's been the truth that they wanted to code the code to behave like that. The truth was not the code. The truth was in the heads of the people that created the code or that wanted the code to be created. So in reality, it's always a chain of people. One has, has the idea and somehow uh, has another guy implementing it. So the truth is always somewhere in somebody's head or in the best case written down. So don't tell me the truth is in the code. The truth most probably is not in the code because Otherwise, people, uh, uh, people would have intentionally have these issues on system level when, when planes fall from the sky. So, so for Sephir, what are we doing for that? So, um, Sephir is pretty small, but from a safety perspective, still rather big. So, we start with a limited scope. So, you know, you can't eat the big burger in one bite. You need to go bite by bite and you need to walk before you can run. So we have a starting scope. So important thing is this is a starting scope. It does not mean that this will be the one and only safety scope forever and ever. So we can expand the scope if needed. If people contribute, then the thing that we need to expand the code. So this is iterative. We start here and we can go much further in, in the future. We initially now target um, cell 3 for IEC 61508. So this is a, let's say, catch almost all certification. Uh, we have an option with our certification body for going for ISO 262 ASLD, um, which mainly means, yeah, we can do automotive if somebody wants automotive, if somebody goes to the board and get the board to vote for automotive for ISO 262 from the doing side, from our side. The only difference is between SIL 3 and ASLD is we need to up this uh, coverage of the tests. So ASLD is like SIL 3 um, plus MCDC coverage in tests. So if you don't know what MCDC coverage is, don't get bothered. If you need it, you will need to look into it. Forget about it if you don't need it. It's pretty annoying if you need to implement the tests for that. So what's the safety element out of context in the end? So as I said already, you have a big system that in itself has a safety function and you have these little components. And Sephir is now is one of these components within a software architecture that goes into a complete system that does something is then developed, in the, or it, it is already developed independently of a final application. So there are so many applications around where we know there is Sephir in it. They are already very different to each other. And there are a lot, lot more applications with Sephir that we don't know about it. And with safety, we have the same approach. So we have a generic certification or generic qualification, generic evidences that we describe what we already did 
we will uh, ship or create a safety manual with it that gives everybody the information, yeah, take what we have and integrate it to your stuff and then do this on top to have a valid safety argument for your system. It will come with sufficient evidence, like, yeah, as I already spoke about, it's a test evidence, requirements, traceability from requirements through an architecture to the code, uh, traceability and coverage um, of the tests so that you can see a, this level of test, uh, this level of coverage is here. Um, for my application, this is fine, or for my application, I want more. But first of all, you need somebody to create the information, right? So, um, oh, we have not spoken, have we spoken about systematic capability? It wasn't one of the previous slides. So, um, as you have the capability of the complete system to perform a safety task, and you need to have the components that you're relying on, and in the case of software, you do not have a mechanical or a thermal um, property that you need to fulfill. So the only thing you can have is that the software has a systematic capability saying it has been developed in a way that you can be sure that it does what has been specified for it. Um, and when you look into the safety standards or specifically in the safety standard that we use, the IEC 61508 in the part three, that's a part for software, it says that if you have a pre-existing software element and you want to reuse it, you need uh, to follow one of these three routes. Um, route, uh, route one is compliance of the with the requirements of the complete standard. That's something that you do for a new development in real life, so nothing for us. Route two as proven in use. Um, I'm doing safety now for, let's say, including the time as a developer for more than 20 years, and I've never come across a valid proven in use argument. So if you have one, please let me know. That will be the first one to know about. So also does not work for Zephyr. But we have the root 3S, <laughs> and that means assessment of this non-compliant development, so assessment of what we are doing in uh, Zephyr, and it says compliance with the next clauses, <laughs> the 7.4.2.13. And the 7.4.2.13 has wonderful uh, subsections that we need to fulfill, A to I, um, and the first one I already says, uh, the software safety requirement specification for the element shall blah, shall be documented, so more or less it shall be there. So what are we doing in Cephyr? <laughs> we we are currently creating system and software specifications. If we, you look into the Cephyr project, it comes with a lot of documentation that if you want to get it integrated to something, if you want to get it run, on your um, platform, you get a lot of very detailed low-level information. And we will reuse this for the certification. But we don't have the big overall picture. We don't have the picture that you take to sell it to your management. We don't have the picture you sell to your safety assessor, and that's what we're currently creating. Then we have the next one. So. We need to provide evidence that the safety properties uh, specified are already there. So, yeah, we come up, uh, came up with safety claims, more or less saying what what's specified for Cephyr, that's what we are really doing. We're doing this with uh, the integrity of SIL 3, and that's what we wrote into the safety claims, and that we have the traceability from requirements to code to test to show you the needed coverages. To the next one. The elements design shall be documented to a degree of precision sufficient to provide evidence of compliance with the requirements. We're back to the requirements. So we reuse the documents that we already have in the docs, the information that we have there. Uh, that's if you look into it, and we've talked about it with our assessor. It's already pretty much everything that you need for a detailed design and a de uh, interface specification, so the lowest level of 
uh, requirement that you usually have in a safety project. If you look into the docs of CEPHA, that's pretty much what we already have. So we just need to create the uh, higher level requirements, establish traceability, and then we are there. Um, yeah, also the evidence is that we have required in the points before um, shall cover also the integration with the hardware. So, yeah, there are already very ma um, uh, many tests in Cephal, and once we have uh, our requirements, we can establish the traceability to these tests and to the test evidences, and then show the coverage and most probably fill a little few of gaps, which is a technical point and a te technical task and shouldn't be too much issue. The big issue at the moment is really the creation of the requirements. And next point is again something with tests. So we shall provide evidence that um, we have done our verification and validation and with that we have a systematic approach. So Zephyr already has a systematic approach. What we did is writing down um, a verification strategy that we can hand into our assessor so that the assessor also understands what's going on in the CEPHA project. So it's nothing that we need to invent. It's already there. We just need to translate it for our assessor. And um, yeah, again, establish traceability, establish our requirements so that we have something to trace from. Um, Oh, that's an important point. Always in safety, you need to make sure that if you have non-safety parts of your application or if you have parts in your application that you have no knowledge about, that these are, have, have in no way a chance to influence your safety part. And with Cephal, this is already very easy. If you look into it, there's a very strong cohesion within the components that you see in Cephal. And it's, uh, when we look into our safety scope, it's uh, without problems that we can say, okay, our scope is the kernel plus X. And this we can really use to build, um, um, to, yeah, to build an, an Artos with it that in itself is, is really an Artos and not, not just some uh, artificial construct that we want to certify. No, we will have an Artos that in itself works independently of the things that in the CEPHA project that are not in the current safety scope. Yeah, we need the evidence that, the, so it, you, you see there's a, there's a lot of stuff in the safety standards what you need to do, but you will come into a mode where it repeats itself. So in the end, it always, also here it comes down for, yeah, we need to make sure that we have our requirements and we need to make sure we have our traceability so we can see we have covered everything that we want to cover. Next, yeah, information um, about configuration. So what is the actual version? What's the actual configuration of um, the safety scope that is really qualified for safety? This is something that will go into the safety manual with all other integration obligation and that stuff that um, yeah, you need to know in the end for a safe application. And a last point in this clause 7423, the justification for use of the element shall be valid only for those applications with respect to the assumptions made in the safety manual. We already talked about it, there will be one. And if we look into back into the 0 0.7, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.12, that was now what it wanted in section A. It also wants to, uh, that we perform or do what's in section B. And it again says, we need to provide a safety manual. Yes, we will do that. So in the end, it will look very similar to this. In functional safety, what we are doing is really creating a lot of paper trail or evidences. Yes, that is what we do <laughs> also for Cephal, but we do, uh, do this in this way. So we have the creation of the planning documents um, where needed adding information to the docs. So if you look in uh, to the Cephal docs, you will see there's a safety section and this is where we adding the information for the community as a starting point. 
Uh, we also create the stuff, the safety plan, requirements management plan, configuration management plan, tool qualification, plan, evidence, whatever. This is what we create. So yeah, it's a lot of work. That's what we do. And also the evidences for these documents. So this, yeah, as I said, the safety plan, we create safe, uh, uh, the requirements, the system requirements, the software requirements. We uh, thankfully already have code. Um, there's the build environment, so we don't need to invent something there. So there's already a lot of stuff in Cephal. So the technical stuff you need for certification we have. It's, it's documentation that we need to create. And in the end, uh, we also have uh, reviews now established using the, the normal GitHub uh, PR process flow. So there is already the PR process when you look into code contributions, when you look into contribution to the docs, that's an, and that's the same way we work when we create requirements, when we create plans. When I create a plan, I need to make a PR. Simon will look through what I've created and merge it into the, the section for the plans. When whoever creates a requirement, there will be a PR or there is a PR and we can discuss it. In the end, it gets adapted and merged. And for the safety architecture, um, we will provide the information in the safety manual so that everybody who wants to use the safe Zephyr they know what to do for their system. So, cr actual creation of work products. So, we have uh, two groups working on this in Cephas. So, we have the safety committee, which is a group formed by platinum members interested in safety. These are the ones really steering the certification process. So, we really needed to distinguish between hey, we are creating all the safety uh, stuff that you need for taking Sephir and certifying it. And then we have this, the safety committee really going through a first certification with a defined subset of what we are doing. So in the committee, it's really a defined uh, certification scope. It's the, uh, the uh, group that decides on which standards to uh, cover. So if you want another standard, become a platinum member, go to the board, vote for it then we can add another standard. Um, from the committee side, also the assessment with TUV and the audits are organized. That's also where I'm in. So um, yeah, limited to the platinum members, to the safety architect. So this is Simon um, Hein from Baumer and to the safety manager, which is currently me. So, and then we have the safety working group that's really open to everyone where we have weekly meetings where we are working on the real stuff, um, where we are setting up tooling. So that's really the hands-on group that's driving stuff. And it's open, so each Tuesday. Um, we have a defined work product structure. So this is just for overview. This is not, the picture here is not complete. So it's just, as you see, we have a defined structure. We want to have everything traceable. This means um, we need, we needed to find a tooling for that. We decided to go to with strict docs. So it's something that I highly recommend looking into. It's something between Sphinx and YAML. Um, it's very easy to set up. It's text. It's completely text-based. You have a um, when you you can you have this color coding when you work with VCC, so you just have a VCC tab for your code. You have your VCC tab for the documentation with strict doc. It just works like any other code. So I always say it's specification is code, but it's a, a term that's not standardized. So don't ask me specifically what it is. It's just how I think about it. Everything is code because I can everything. I need to build stuff from it. It's not a VCC. It's not. We, it's not one of these big life cycle systems uh, that you need to, that you're then, let's say, closed in and you need to pay a lot of money for um, licenses. It's open source and it, it has an active um, main contributor, Stan. I, yeah, this is about Zephyr, sorry. Um, so we create all new documents in strict doc. With the plans, each planning item is a requirement in the strict doc format, so we can trace it. We can trace 
where, where does it come from, where is it implemented, and is it ver uh, uh, verified. Uh, we also in, enhance the normal community documentation in the docs using the things that's already there. And the beauty of the project at the moment also is that we use strict doc also for our um, safety assessment. So we have our uh, the safety assessment converted into strict doc format. Each check item is a requirement that traces to the child uh, requirement that's then fulfilled in our documentation. So once we start um, changing stuff, we can use the traceability matrix generated by strict to, to identify where we need to adapt things for the next certification. Um, this is how it actually looks like. Um, this is just a screenshot from the beginning when we started to work with strict doc. It's, yeah, pretty easy to work with. Um, this is the example from the requirements, but our plans actually, they look the same and our checklist also looks the same. So from a coding person's perspective, this is pretty comfortable to use. Um, I've been talking a lot about documents, but we also actually have the code and also code needs to be of a certain quality uh, for safety certification, uh, it needs to follow coding guidelines. So be even before I started, the project agreed on a set of coding guidelines and then started to implement those. And thanks to the boxing uh, guys who supported us there, um, the coding guideline deviations have been identified and uh, changes have been made. And rather recently, the guys from Baumer really um, merged the, all these uh, back to the main, or most of them, so um, together with the maintainers. And one of the main discussion points on that was, yeah, okay, we have these coding guidelines, but we don't have a checking tool within the CI at the moment, so developers would have needed to get their own license on whatever tooling to have an automated check for this. Um, this is coming soon. I think it's planned for October that we have a static analysis running in the CI. So this issue is also now solved. Um, from the assessment point of view, we are doing the assessment in the typical two phases. We have a concept phase that's currently going on. So this is, we did the concept audit. Um, we have a checklist, uh, we have the information provided for that, so we're waiting now for feedback. So I hope we can come uh, around the corner very soon with uh, more uh, information about uh, the concept approval. And we are already also working on the work products of the detailed phase, yeah, on more detailed requirements, <laughs> on traceability, on tests, on tool qualification. So we're working on it while we're waiting for the concept approval. So. Where should you start with us? So I can't say it often enough, please read the docs. Not only read the docs when you integrate something with Zephyr to play around, also there are two sections currently talking about safety. It's a safety overview and it's a safe requirements guideline. Um, you find the links there in the QR co code, but yeah, just open the docs search on the left side for safety and then you find that stuff, read through it. If you have questions, if, you know, it's something that we wrote with our mind. If you find something missing, if you have questions, just contact us, talk to us, let us know. We're happy to add stuff. We're happy to talk to you 101 or you show up in uh, the working group. Um, you can uh, sign up on the mailing list. You can have a look into the requirements repo, what's currently going on. Um, an easy way to start really is give us feedback on what's already there. It's work in progress. We're always learning, Even, you know, we, we're, some of us are doing safety for quite a long time, but safety is never 100%. It can always be better. Um, there are still requirements for some components missing you'll find a list in the safety working group project about what 
components we want to um, create requirements uh, with, uh, for. So if you're feeling cheeky, grab one, create requirements, make a PR, or best of all, come to the working group meetings once a week, Tuesday, 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Um, yeah, talk to us, ask us, show up in the working group meetings. Um, if you have questions, if you think our material is missing information, don't sulk, just talk to us, say this is missing, can you, uh, can you tell me about it? We will tell you about it, we most probably will have a plan to then add this, doc uh, this information, so if you have a, a question, at least 100 p uh, people more will have this question too. So. If you ask us a question, we can improve and increase our documentation about it. And if you want to contribute, you're very, very welcome. So yeah, that's been it. Thank you, everybody. Are there already questions? So. Hi. So, is the whole safari is going to be contemplated in the safety model, or are there some features that are deemed inherently unsafe and are not going to be um, put on the model? So, within the safety scope, there are no features that are inherently unsafe. There are in the whole project there are features that are not used in safety, and we most probably will not go for them. So, you don't use Bluetooth in safety, at least not in a way that where you trust the Bluetooth protocol. So you would need to establish um, an end-to-end -end, um, mechanism, safety mechanism anyway. So we don't go for Bluetooth or stuff like that at the moment. So we really go for the kernel core and there is nothing that is inherently safe. Uh, un sorry, there's <laughs> nothing that's inherently unsafe. Um, for sure, there would be stuff where we say, okay, we could implement this or that extra safety mechanism for Zephyr, but that's more something for the future. At the moment, it's really go for this root 3S, qualify and certify what we have and take it from there. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. I'm the one with the red coat. Um, hi. It's probably out of scope, but uh, what's, what's the SEAL 3 level again? It was a long time I worked with this safety stuff. Uh, the SEAL 3? What? Uh, SEAL or SEAL. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, it made, means safety integrity level. Okay, that's one to add to the slides. <laughs> I completely forgot about to introduce that term. Yeah, it may, means safety integrity level. Um, the, let's say there's a scheme for each safety standard in IEC 61508. We have SIL 1 to SIL 4. Um, SIL 4 is really something where you speak uh, power plant, uh, big environmental issues, uh, hundreds of people injured or dead if something goes wrong. So the most critical uh, industry application usually are SIL 3. Uh, so the usual robotic application is something like that, um, and that's the level we are going for. So SIL 1, SIL 2 are below that. Um, I don't have examples at the top of my mind at the moment for that ones, um, but do you have? Railroad is SIL 1, SIL 2, so yeah, we're going for a little bit above that. And this doesn't need redundancy, so... SIL 3 doesn't need redundancy. No, SIL 3 does not need, need redundancy. Um, ASIL D would need that, but now comes the safety element out of context thing uh, again. So the system will need these redundancies. And in a SIL or in an ASIL D architecture, uh, Cepha would come in with the integrity of ASIL D. So ASIL D is a little bit high, it's the automotive safety integrity level. And to have this redundant architecture, this is something the system architect would need to consider. So we, as an RTOS, this is nothing you can consider realistically. 
because that would just destroy all this we're standing for to being small and um, resource saving. If you go into redundancies, this will blow up everything. Thank you. And this, yeah, just give it back to the back. One step. One step. Yeah. Can you please elaborate a bit on the, uh, give some examples of what would be part of the first certification scope? Um, so we have here an initial overview that we created, where was it, that we created as a base for discussion. So yeah, we have threats, as threats we have the semaphore, so we have uh, queues, timing, memory, memory management, so really the basic things that you need to be an artist. Okay. And what about uh, tool chain and compilers in general? So will we will you give some? Um, the two. So uh, the compiler is always platform uh, specifics, and our initial scope will be platform agnostic. So we don't look too deep into um, the modules, really um, the interfaces to the platforms. Um, so we also don't uh, qualify the compiler. What we do is uh, we do analysis of our tool chain as we have it. And do, do, we actually follow the automotive approach with really saying, hey, what can go wrong with this tool? Do we catch it in the process or do we need tool qualification for it? Okay. So it will be part of your safety manual. So with some expectations will be on the part of, Yeah, it, it, how to, to use it will be part of the safety manual, if not already in the docs. Mm -hmm. so the docs already tell you how to use the Zephyr tool chain. What we will put in the safety manual is what do you need to do on top for safety. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, there was a question way in the back. Uh, very related to this slide. Um, is there an aspirational timeline for when this first initial set will be? Um, there's a relative timeline that says the more people that contribute, the faster we are. <laughs> yeah, you know, we could have been done, done this last year, but we need people to contribute. We can't, we can't do everything on our own of the people that are currently in the working group. So that's why, please show up, contribute, even if you just lurk for the first weeks and listen and learn and come around the corner with something way later, that's fine, you know, it's, everybody's welcome. Sadly, 4 p.m. is uh, a bit late for Australian time. But, <laughs> oh, I'm very sorry for that. It's all good. Um, um, if, if there's no aspirational timeline, then like, do you have an approximate percentage of how far through you think you are? I didn't get that, sorry. Do you have an idea of how far you think you are through, like 30%, 50%, 70%? Uh, I say, oh, that's a difficult one. I from, let's say, from the functional safety management part, I'd say we are now at 80%, so mainly the tool stuff is missing to go through the tool chain and do all this documentation that we need. Um, from the requirements point of view, I'd say we are now at, I don't know, 30%? Psst. <laughs> now, yeah. Oh, with the PR, there's, in the PRs, there's a lot of stuff, so, um, yeah. Thanks. And Roberto. I have several questions. Maybe I missed something. Uh, who is the certification body? Uh, TÜV Süd. TÜV Süd. And then the other question is, uh, uh, which tools do you, plan, do you plan to qualify? You said not the compilers. Uh, um, you said that you, you will qualify tools. other so tools. We will, yeah, we're looking to West, okay. uh, Strict Doc. We won't have an issue with the static code analysis tool that is certified. Yeah. And another question is, uh, um, uh, what, do you, what will you use to check uh, traceability between the code, the tests, and the software specifications? Uh, we will have a mix. So we will use a partially strict doc. And um, then there's this um, traceability scripting that Anas did where Anas and Simon are now working in the background to b bring up something that we can use the strict doc stuff and the tracing from Anas that already is there. So we have a hybrid solution. You also have a third possibility because Eclair does this. So 
based on strict dog. So it, it can it can do it. So you have a third we can, way. We can do it. Yeah. And, and the final question is, uh, um, um, what what will you do to prove uh, uh, independence or freedom from interference uh, between um, different components? Do you have to do it? We will do a software FMEA. Okay. That's okay. And we can um, we can prove stuff by also saying okay, from the stuff that we don't look into, that's really also by the software arch or by the architecture of software, it cannot interfere because there is no there is nothing. But you need the, you need you need the tool right to make sure that uh, uh, I don't know something that is in the scope does not depend on something that is outside the scope. So you have no, to... So that's what we will do by the FMEA analysis, something like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, do, do we still have time for more questions? I have... Yes. Yes. Okay. Are there more questions? Okay, then we close this session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.